origins of the assassins lie hundreds of miles away from the Holy Land, in 11th century Persia, the country we now know as Iran. The Islamic world is torn apart by the age-old struggle between Sunni and Shiite Muslims. It's a division about who follows the truest Islamic tradition. The Sunni believe that they are the, the rightful preservers of that tradition. They're the party of, of the community. Their rivals, the Shiites, support a different tradition that takes its authority from the Prophet Muhammad's descendants. The followers of Ali, the son-in-law and the cousin of the Prophet, say that the Imams, the political religious leaders of their faith, should descend from him. Even today, this rivalry within Islam fuels bitter religious conflict. In a remote area of northern Persia is the mountain fortress of Alamut. It is here that a particular Shiite community, the Ismailis, takes refuge. They were a small, marginalized, persecuted sect of Islam at a time when it was extremely unhealthy to be any of those things. Their base is known as the Eagle's Nest. Alamut itself is a natural fortress. It's not like a crusader castle that's built with a tremendous amount of science, but it sits atop a natural redoubt that's 300 feet, almost like a sheer cliff. And at the bottom, you've got very deep gorges. It's very, very difficult to approach. The leader of this small remote community is Hassan E. Sabah, a charismatic man who demands total devotion from his followers. One wonders if he had a rather magnetic or perhaps hypnotic personality about him as well to draw these people to him, despite the fact that he's actually asking them to submit to a very, very harsh regime indeed. Hassan's Ismailis are facing overwhelming odds. His Sunni enemies have a vast army of 300,000 men. He will have to wage what we now call asymmetric warfare. He's not in a position to fight back. He's not got large armies at his disposal. To survive, Hassan has to find something he can do even with limited manpower. Finally, he hits on a radical solution. He will decapitate his Sunni enemies by murdering their leader. They're not going to be able to defeat him in battle, so they go in on a much narrower front. They're going to take out the man himself. At the top of the Persian hierarchy, Nizam al-Mulk is a champion of Sunni orthodoxy. He's basically a one-man government, and he has made it his work to root out heresy right at the center of the Persian state. Hassan's Ismailis are one of his prime targets. He's described them as the pus of sedition. He really thinks they should be expelled. So if Hassan picks him out and if he removes him, he really will be striking a blow against the man who is the real cheerleader against his group. Hassan starts to train an elite squad to carry out the mission. They're chosen from his most devoted followers the Fidayeen. The uh, early Fidayeen were 
almost certainly from that particular area of Iran. So these are tough mountain men. Hassan begins by teaching them how to fight at close quarters. Their actual personal skills are in many ways much higher than you find in armies today. So commandos won't be so well trained in individual hand-to-hand -hand combat. Because they have technology, people today rely on technology. Then they have no technology, it was just them. They were the weapon. The key question is how to make the hit, to take out their target. They could have killed people using poison. But the victim could take an antidote and survive. They could have killed people using arrows or, or, or projectile weapons. But there's always the risk of missing the vital organs. Eventually, the weapon they choose is the dagger. Striking up close, you can make sure of a kill. A dagger gives you a greater chance of actually achieving your aim. But using daggers in combat demands immense skill. Throughout history, there's only three different types of weapons available in a dagger. You have a stabbing, you have a slashing, and you have a slashing and stabbing. Now, the first one we have is something like a stiletto. The key point about a stiletto is it's very strong, thin blade for high penetration power. So a stabbing of a stiletto goes straight through, so in and stab through. With the weapon concealed, you walk towards me, pull out, stab, walk on. The next type is a slashing blade. From here, they will just draw and slash. As you can see, in one motion, it would be very hard to even see that it happened. The third major design would be a slashing and stabbing weapon. Now, this is a modern version. So from here, it's got a sharp blade that curves. It would also have a back blade, so you can cut back if you miss. Very strong guard here. This guard allows you to stab down very heavily. So you have different options as to how you move and how to combine it. The Ismaili's next step is familiar to today's special forces, to gather local intelligence on their target. It's a big operation. It will require inside knowledge. An Ismaili spy infiltrates the Sunni leader's headquarters, watching Nizam al-Mulk's every move. How does he conduct his life? What's the best opportunity we can get? Where is there a chink in that armor? This information is fed back to base. With a detailed profile of his target, Hassan identifies what he thinks is a weakness in Al-Mulk's security. That weakness is his religion. This is the only way he's gonna actually get that close to him. And he calls on a man to represent a Sufi mystic, a holy man, an ascetic, somebody who normally one would never suspect of misdeed. A Sufi would be seen as a man of peace. Anybody who has an air of holiness about them is almost guaranteed a warm reception from a powerful leader of the secular state, such as Nizam al-Mulk. The opportunity to be blessed by such an individual is not to be missed. Having worked out how to get close to him, Hassan's next problem is how to kill him. The trick is to use distraction. The person must be distracted by an event, so you trip or you drop something and this moment you exploit it. The 
chosen killer rehearses the technique. After months of training, he is ready. Hassan's trained killer infiltrates the Sunni base. No one suspects a holy man. In the quarters of Nizam al-Mulk, there is no sense of any threat. Everything is routine. At this time of the evening, Nizam al-Mulk is probably in high spirits. He has finished his work for the day. This is perfect timing, Bada Ismailis. He's much more difficult to actually get anywhere near during the normal working business day. So no doubt in his own mind, he's thinking of the pleasures of the evening among his women. In the shadows, the Ismaili killer waits for the moment to strike. Al-Mulk is about to be carried off to his harem, on his litter. But then, he sees the Sufi holy man approaching. He's quite prepared to let this guy in and give him a blessing on his way. Stabs the man, stabs Nizam al-Mulk, and kills him. The distraction has worked. Killing the leader of the Sunnis is a massive triumph for Hassan's Ismailis. He was a great man, no two ways about it, and therefore, to take him down was a real message. If we can get him, we can get anybody. So you take on the Ismailis of Alamut at your peril. Over the coming years, Hassan presses home his advantage. He launches a range of terror attacks, which would be familiar to us today. There's about 25 assassinations in this early period. They really do enter quite a little golden patch or a purple patch where they have a number of successes. They were prepared to do anything to win. The way that the assassins killed was absolutely amazing. They made themselves appear like ghosts. They would come in, stab, disappear. They changed their mode of operating every single time. Only one thing stayed the same, and that was that they killed by a dagger. Their murder of Al-Mulk triggers the collapse of his Sunni empire. They've proved that their tiny force can take on a vastly superior enemy and win. They were one of the first groups who used deliberately small groups of highly trained men in asymmetric warfare. The success of Hassan's elite killers becomes a talking point on the streets. They are celebrated across the Middle East in a popular poem. It says that with one lone warrior on foot, a king, though he may have a hundred thousand troopers, would be in fear. Soon, the Ismailis discover that like today's suicide bombers, their strategy 
has a secondary effect. They create an atmosphere of dread. With terrorism, the fundamental thing you have to remember is that it's psychological warfare. It's not really about how many people you kill. Um, it's about the impact that you have. It's all the more fearsome because Hassan's men aren't afraid to die. The Sunnis face a huge problem with the Ismailis because the men that are sent on these missions happily embrace death. And that obviously makes them truly terrifying. The echoes today are very familiar. But there is one key difference. The Fidayeen's method is much more precise. It doesn't have collateral damage. It doesn't strike at innocence. It strikes specifically, cleanly and discriminately at the target. The Ismaili strike force is so successful their Sunni enemies try to discredit them. They spread stories about a secret group of brainwashed killers living up in the mountains. They were painted as deviants, as drug users, as um, crazy fanatics. And in, in much the same way that modern terrorist groups often get the same treatment, that um, you know, they're fanatics, um, psychopaths. The myth becomes more and more exotic. Both Muslims and Western Christians retell the story of young killers manipulated by an evil leader. There's talks of potions, uh, promises of, of pleasure gardens forever. Some of the ideas begin to blur a little, that they must be perhaps drug-induced to have this level of devotion. In particular, the Sunnis label them Hashishian, or users of Hashish. The name has stuck. This morphed into the word that we use today for a political killer, assassin. And so, a legend is born. Hassan's special forces become known as the drug-crazed assassins. I don't personally believe that they would have been on drugs. Imagine the focus you need. You need to confirm that target. The thing about drugs is it has an effect. It suppresses or depresses or enlightens. What it does is take away your focus. But defeating Nizam al-Mulk is only the beginning. In the future, they will need to use all their fighting skills to defend their community not only against their Muslim enemies, but a new threat from Christian crusaders.